for the message. I'll read that to you first, and you can follow along silently. And we'll begin a series of messages that I have titled the, the Perils of Prayerlessness. The Perils of Prayerlessness. But we'll look first at Genesis 11, verse 1 to 9. Now the whole earth had <clears throat> one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth but the lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built and the lord said indeed the people are one and they all have one language and this is what they begin to do now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. This is God's word. Father, let your spirit be our teacher. Cover your servant with your glory. And let it be that Christ alone be magnified as we look to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, you've been hearing in the last few messages and, you know, even with Pastor Elburn's preaching, as I said, that prayer is the greater work, right? And I would like to share to you some blessings that others have told me. One is that Solomon Malik, for whom we've been praying, has asked me to share that his papers has been approved, right? So we thank the Lord for that. Isle has also given me an update that you know, for many weeks now, we've been praying for power to change in University of Saskatchewan, right? Remember that school? They had been rat deratified as to their ministry in the campus. And I was just telling me uh, through email that she said, you know, Pastor, the, the deratification of power to change has been reversed. And so they're even looking forward now that when they are able to do so in campus, that they would be able to conduct their usual ministries using the different facilities and buildings of, of the school. So God is working. Prayer is the greater work. Uh, today, we've just heard from Matthew, you know, when he heard about this Amber Alert, right? <laughs> That's wonderful, right? He was saying it was resolved. The, the, the problem was solved. It's amazing that, you know, even through the simple things, that God is showing us that that's really true. Prayer is not ju just the preparation for the greater work. It is the greater work. I hope that as we are going through the book of Nehemiah in the times when I preach, that you are reading through the book of Nehemiah. And you will find this one thing as you look at, the, as, at Nehemiah. You will find that he was really engaging in the work of prayer just as much as he was actually doing the work of building the wall and many other challenges that he was facing. But anyway, as we as we come here tonight, I'd like to pick up on what we studied last week. Although, you know, as we said, the title of this series of devotions until the end of the month is The Perils of Prayerlessness. And we'll be looking at Genesis 11, 1 to 9 uh, for those perils. But we've been looking at the uh, I think uh, the title of last week's message was A Return to Eden, right? A Theological Brief on the Origins of Prayer. 
And so we learned about how prayer was a conversation with God. Since Adam and Eve were actually created, prayer was a privilege given to them by the Lord. Uh, we surmise that from what we gather from the facts in the Bible, that it was a constant thing that their hearts were expectantly looking for regularly having this walks with the Lord in the beautiful garden of Eden and just enjoying his presence, pouring out their hearts to him and enjoying their conversations with him. And what a great encouragement for us. What a great picture that when we come to prayer, we're actually having a visit, if, you, if I may say, into, the, into Eden once again, a, a visit to heaven, a visit home as we enjoy the presence of God. Uh, I think there's really wisdom in, in following the example of the Lord when he would rise up a great while before day and pray, you know, or just before you go to work when it's still quiet in your home, perhaps, uh, just at, at that time when you can just have this quiet time to just be able to enjoy your conversation with the Lord. But we'd all, we've also learned last week that corporate prayer also had its beginnings in the early days of the human race particularly after the death of Seth's son, Enosh, where the Bible says that men began to call upon the name uh, of the Lord. And so we, we find that, and I'll, I'll talk a little more about that uh, later. But as you go on through from Genesis uh, 2, 3, 4, and I, as, as you go on reading up to the time of Noah, here's an interesting thing that you will discover. As I was going through Genesis chapter 10, it's interesting to, to notice there that there is no mention of anyone calling upon the name of the Lord. There is no mention of anyone walking with the Lord, as in the previous chapters of Genesis. There even seems to be no record of any kind of interaction with the Lord by people. As in, you know, interaction as in prayer, interaction as in worship, here in Genesis chapter 10. Here the genealogy of the sons of Noah are given. There is a commentary made on Nimrod, which we will talk about a little later. But the interesting thing that comes out from Genesis chapter 10, uh, you know, from that time and, and even in chapter 10 and 11 in particular, is that you know, there is no mention of anyone walking or calling upon the name of the Lord. In Genesis 2 and 3, Adam and Eve are walking with God. They're having those conversations with the Lord. In Genesis chapter 4, you can take the time to study it later, there is even conversation between God and Cain. And in that same chapter, the beginnings of people who, uh, people who feared and loved the Lord began praying corporately from the time of Seth when Enosh was born. In Genesis chapter 5, when the genealogy of Adam and even Cain's line is given, we, we read of Enoch who walked with God, right? And who walked with the Lord as such that God took him to be with him. Enoch did not die physically, but as he was walking with the Lord one day, God just walked him home straight to heaven. That's what we read in Genesis chapter 5. In Genesis chapter 6, even in a world that's filled with violence and sin, there is still Noah who is mentioned here. Noah, it is said, walked with the Lord. In Genesis 7 and 8, you know, the flood and after the flood, we, we read of Noah offering sacrifices to the Lord, perhaps leading his family in corporate prayer and worship to the Lord or of the Lord after their great deliverance from the great flood. In Genesis chapter 9, there are still indications that prayer was going on, that people were praying to God for conversations with God were going on. And even, uh, even in Noah's pronouncement of blessing upon him and upon Ham and Japheth, and of course the, the curse upon Ham it is somehow indicative of prayer as Noah invokes blessing upon his sons. Now, as we lay the foundation for this series of devotional messages on the prayers of prayerless, on the perils of prayerlessness, 
I want us to note these observations from Genesis 10, verse 8 to 13. So if you could open your Bible and follow along with me, I, I'll read to you Genesis 10, verse 8 to 13. And we'll just make some quick observations concerning uh, Nimrod, actually, that will provide the, the kind of a groundwork for us leading into those perils that we'll talk about starting next week. It says here in verse 8, Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was, notice this, Babel. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Eric, Akkad, and Kalne, notice this again, in the land of Shinar. You will find those same references in Genesis 11. And from that land, he went to Assyria and built, again, notice this, Nineveh, very familiar city, Rehoboth, Ir, and Kala, and Resen between Nineveh and Kala, that is the principal city. There is a mention of Nimrod. Nimrod was the son of Cush, who in turn was a son of Ham. Remember Ham from Noah, right? Uh, the son who ridiculed Noah when somehow perhaps in his deep stress from life after the flood began, resorted to drinking wine and became drunk. Now, of course, instead of covering the shame of his dad, he, he told his brothers and, and somehow that did not sit well with Noah. And with that, Noah felt dishonored. And the pronouncement that he made was that Cush's or Ham's descendants would then be subordinate to the descendants of Shem and Japhet. Now, that is a key thing to remember in understanding Nimrod. Now, here are just some, some quick observations about Nimrod as we read those verses. Number one, first of all, I want you to note his ability. He was a mighty one on the earth. You know, he was known for his strength. He was known for his hunting skills. He was known for his bravery. Uh, people tend to follow the strong. The strong exert great influence. And we see this in that he is able to establish cities. And he is able to even gather people to embark on this project of building a tower whose, whose height will reach the heavens. He was a very powerful man, very influential man, a mighty hunter. Some translations will say a mighty soldier. A Filipino translation said uh, uh, a mighty kawal. <laughs> well, malakas na kawal. <laughs> you know. Uh, Nimrod knew this dynamic of how the strong uh, uh, how does the strong cause people to follow and he used this to his advantage. Second thing you observe about uh, Nimrod is his reputation. Therefore, it is said, you know, what that means is it became a popular saying during their days that when you talk about Nimrod, people would say, oh, that's the mighty hunter before the Lord. Right? And it is said, many commentators have said that he became famous for hunting down or killing dangerous wild animals. You know, in the Bible, uh, we, re we read of the behemoth, the Leviathan, uh, possible references to dinosaurs in their time. Now, children like to ask this question, Pastor, how did God fit the dinosaurs into the ark? <laughs> Right, <laughs> But you know, nothing is impossible with the Lord. He probably took in younger dinosaurs into the ark, right? And the older dinosaurs, as we see the evidences of the day, died. Their fossils are there, not because of the millions of years, but because of the cataclysmic event of the Great Flood. And so people often say, well, what caused the extinction then of the dinosaurs? Well, probably the change in the climate because of the Great Flood. But possible also because of the activities of mighty hunters 
like Nimrod, the one who was known to be the mightiest of them all. You know, Nimrod probably contributed to the ex extinction of these majestic animals. To hunt these enormous animals probably gained him extraordinary fame. Oh, when you mention the name Nimrod, they would remember the mighty hunter before the Lord. But notice also his rebellion. You know, we think of that phrase, before the Lord. It doesn't mean that Nimrod was praying before he hunted, no. But just briefly, the idea there is that he was actually flaunting his prowess before God. Remember the curse that was given upon the descendants of Ham? You know, uh, you know uh, that would have been told to one generation after the other. Maybe this was Nimrod's way of saying, oh, <laughs> The descendants of Ham will serve the descendants of Ham, of, of Shem and Japheth. I'll show you. I will show you. And so, look, it was like he was saying before the Lord, look, who's serving who now? <laughs> the descendants of Ham serving? No. Nope. We're the most powerful people now on the earth. He, 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 he endeavored to replace God's glory with his fame before the lord he put himself before god so that when people look at him they did not think of god who gave him his strength they thought only of nimrod i'm sure that in every pastor's heart who desires to glorify the lord in every teacher's heart who desires to glorify the lord that when they teach the word they would not say oh what a great teacher or oh what a great pastor but their desire for the lord is Oh, what a great God, right? Now, Nimrod's problem was he grabbed the glory for himself that he should have given to the Lord. A mighty hunter before the Lord. Now notice also his contrary purposes and pursuits. In Genesis chapter 9, we are told that God commanded Noah and his children to fill the earth. To fill the earth to to multiply and fill the earth but nimrod said no <laughs> we are going to stick together and build a city whose tower reaches up to the sky that sounds familiar right i remember when lucifer was thrown out of heaven because he said i will be like the most high i remember in genesis chapter 3 when the serpent tempted Eve and said, eat this and you will be like God. Sounds familiar. Notice also his ruthlessness. A mighty hunter before the Lord. Uh, scholars believe that he progressed from hunting animals to hunting people. Uh, you will see evidence of that in Genesis 11. Perhaps some of them forcibly making them his slaves so that he could construct this great project whose end will reach to the heavens or perhaps others just drawn to him by sheer reputation now let this be a warning to us then that prayerlessness leads us on the road that nimrod traveled we rely on our on our own abilities and as we succeed, our pride is fed. And in the process, we become drunk with our reputation. And our reputation, and with our reputation for success, as we want more success, we become a ruthless people. This was what was happening to Nimrod. Instead of caring for people, he began to use them. Do you know why this happens? Uh, because, let me say this. Prayerlessness is both the evidence and the cause of our disconnect from God. Let me say that again. Prayerlessness is both the evidence and the cause of our disconnect with the Lord. So here's the principle I want us to take home as we go through this series of devotionals. Prayer attunes 
our hearts to God. Prayer attunes our hearts to God. You know, do you remember that song? God answers prayer in the morning, right? God answers prayer at noon. God answers prayer in the evening. So keep your heart in tune. Prayerlessness is both the evidence and the cause of our disconnected God. But prayer attunes our hearts to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Father, as we embark on this series, I pray that you will use every uh, part to bless the hearts of your people and to move us to pray. We continue to lift up to you, Lord, your children in CABC. We continue to pray that you will call more of us to pray together as a body. And we pray for those who are praying along with us, perhaps because there's their schedules will not allow them to be here with us tonight. May you bless them, Father. And we thank you for their partnership in this great ministry of intercession and prayer. Father, we commit our time to you now. Bless us, Lord. And I pray that uh, we will truly remember as we pray tonight that prayer is the greater work. Thank you for the example of Christ. Let us follow, O oh Lord, in his steps. In Jesus' name. Amen.